Crossley Tunnel in Atlanta, Georgia. An attraction steeped in color, home to spicy characters, and of course, lots of local art, if you can't tell. Come on. <laughs> now folks from all walks of life, journey through this tunnel, with the consoles in their head, pressures on their chests, <laughs> and hot spray hands. Hey, they leave it on the wall. <laughs> ah, don't hurt yourself trying to fix your blank. Because believe me, I already cried, but the people have made this tunnel their own. I mean, I'm looking at the energy right now and I'm feeling it. It's everywhere, there's culture in it. And at the heart of it all is a movement that's over a half a century old. A movement with an angel and a devil on its shoulder. A movement called Beauty and Hat. or through worlds, whatever your creed is, but it has a name. It's called graffiti. It's alive. I'm Ari Bradley, and this is the soul of graffiti. I want you to imagine a world where walls could tell a story. What would they say? What would highway barriers leading to Buckhead say to the abandoned brick walls in their shadow? Or illustrious murals in Decatur to the martyr trains of Atlanta, Georgia? They're practically cousins, right? But family is tricky. Things are complicated. They all lead lives defined by other people and no one asks for their story. So many tattoos. Tattoos from those who needed a canvas. These walls have street cred, yet they never say a word. Why is that? What did they have to say and what is their story? Well, it all starts with that ink on their back, pinned by the graffiti movement in the bustling cities of America. But it was the soul of the South, better known as Atlanta, whose signature defined the rise of graffiti. Atlanta is home to millions of people from all different backgrounds and beautiful colors. It's a hearth for creatives far from home and a canvas for performing artists, game designers, rappers, and filmmakers. And then music has always been big in Atlanta. I think at first it was underrated, but I think now with bigger artists like Lil Baby, Earth Gang, a lot of them, you're starting to get like, okay, Atlanta is definitely a contender against like New York, Chicago, California, like everywhere. Atlanta, I think, is definitely a special place because it shows off diversity. My Atlanta city natives are very particular, and it reminds me more of home than it is when you get toward the suburbs. You find more transplant people that are like from Jersey or other places. Just a blessing. Like, it just opened my eyes. So Atlanta just kind of became this mecca of inspiration for me. So I learned so much. I got into contact and networked with so many creatives. I've just been inspired in just a whole new way just being in the city now. Graffiti is public poetry that embodies the spirit in Atlanta's alive underground scene. The art form is worth a special value to its diverse dwellers. In the past, I always thought it was just an art. People have their own way of expressing themselves, you know? Such as, what does it mean to them and to us? If I become an artist, what kind of message would I be sending? Graffiti now has beauty behind the art, the lines, and the colors. It may not even be considered vandalism. So, what is graffiti? That's a funny question. Um, actually, my mom, <laughs> she was commissioned to do a mural. She did some graffiti on it. And so I was maybe seven or eight and I was with her for part of that process. And I remember thinking it was super cool. Just another way of writing. Just another way of expression. Just like, just how you have different genres of music, like common. They look at someone like Chief Keef, who's violent and crude. They're like, oh, no, no way, like that. I can compare that to professional graffiti and tagging. 
that stood for you at its essence. So it's like, you can't really be mad at that. You can be mad if it's your damn building. It's like, damn, you just paint on my building, fam. In the loosest terms, graffiti is street art. Think illustrations, artistic expression, and drawings legal and illegal on public or private property. This includes tags on trains, another language on the side of mom and pop country stores, and chicken scratch inside bathroom stalls, often socially charged. Cartoons aren't always kid friendly, but they mean something. What is art and is graffiti an art form? Establishment people scoffed at the progressive expressionist for their unfinished work. While postmodern warriors still troll the modernists, million dollars still cubes. Folks tend to picture Jack neighborhoods before they think of beautiful murals oozing with life around the corner. My, my, my. There's been a long confusion among the nation's people who can't quite wrap their head around this transnational movement with its roots on American soil. How did graffiti get here? How did we get here? And there's always the weak sheep who must follow the crowd, right or wrong. If others have painted their names on something, he must do the same. There's a lot to unpack. People have been writing on walls and stuff that's not theirs for all of humankind. Like we can go, depending on like what kind of definition you want to use, we can look back at you know, like cave writing. Some people have found these like kind of public walls near like Pompeii, where people would just kind of write stuff and then kind of go back on. It almost became this like what we think of now, a message board type thing. The first graffiti could be traced to the stick figures of Roman catacombs where unwelcome Christians and Jews went for spiritual reasons. Other accounts come from ancient Egypt where hieroglyphs became immortal oracles for generations of Egyptian children or nudus, Egyptian slang for children. And some theorize that cavemen and women from Europe started the tradition, but it caught on in the States starting with the Virginia Graffiti House. The term graffiti originating from the Greek term graphian, translation, right, caught on in the 15th century, being used to describe quaint drawings on walls. Depictions of identity and culture became constant all over the world. A new invention by Chicago's Edward Seymour made its debut in 1949, known as the paint spray can, which made it easier for expression. However, the spray paint can's creation was a global feat with efforts from the US military during World War II for bug spray which combined Norwegian Eric Rothiam's basic model from years earlier with Swiss immigrant Robert Abpanow's aerosol pressure valve. This development set graffiti on the path towards its latter contemporary art form status. It's not until the 60s, with the meteoric rise of tags in Philly, that the alternative art community noticed. When we look at graffiti, really got its start in Philadelphia. Philly is still to this day is known for what's called hand styles. Think of it like a tag, a little signature, little initials. Very simple in terms of one color, and I'm just doing this, but Philly then was like, all right, how can we make this bigger and better? So they have wild style, they call them wickeds. And so you're looking and you can even sit there and watch somebody do it. And you're like, still have no idea what that says. And they're like, oh, that's because you're not from Philly. A tag's purpose developed as a writer's way to speak without being present. Writers combine color theory, calligraphy, and penmanship for celebrity in the streets, with quick throw-ups or throwies, distinctive for their simplicity in bubble letters. The word tyke came to mind to describe beginning writers with little to no experience who wanted to say something. This primitive period came to be the tyke era, the genesis of graffiti activists. Negro leaders feared that their work had failed. Those who did come waited singing. At the climax for the Battle of Equality, young black kids would express their feelings by doodling on sidewalks and boarded up windows in America's segregated ghettos.
New York took it and was like, hey, let's put it on subways. Let's add some color, let's add some detail. Instead of just doing normal writing, let's make these 3D letters, let's add these colors, let's add this highlight, this depth, these characters. It's developed, styles have changed and people have added this and that. I mean, just like any art movement, it starts off and then people start figuring stuff out. It's 1973, an objectively crazy year. Roe v. Wade was decided in favor of abortion, a milestone for women's rights, but a decision that drove wedges between families. Things were tense. No, things were raw. And what did America do? I like Georgia's peanut farmer and governor for president, Jimmy Carter. Freedom reigned and fashion reflected a new culture of exploration outside of the norm. Despite the excitement from whites, blacks, and non-white Atlantans, the city remained a hotbed for racism and unrest with de facto segregated communities. Graffiti became more stylized and underground spots multiplied. Basquiat, Keith Haring, other kind of smaller, not necessarily as well-known household names, but they were some of the first people to really turn this into something where people were like, oh, like, it's not just vandalism, that's art. But also on the rise was an underground movement based in the Bronx that combined the hive mind of Jamaican American DJ Cool Herc and the Geechee Gullah's Southern Hambone tradition. Growing up in the 80s, literally this is who I was listening to, Michael Jackson, Prince, Bon Jovi, because <laughs> I definitely was into rock, Blondie video. Basquiat is in there, he plays the DJ. And it's Fab Five Freddy, who is also, and is a graffiti artist, CBGB back in the day and all that kind of stuff. That was pretty cool. That was really, really cool. Keith Harrington message and his public display of his message, but it was still his own universe of characters. I j it was just the way he like, cultivated his art. I just, I love it. He has an inner child, you know? I love art like that. It's very inspirational. His art style looks so innocent as a child, but still has the message of like really grown adult I love those type of artists. New York was kind of the one to really just ramp it up, man. The late 70s marked an adolescence period for writers as the era of the individual took shape. Joe Michel Basquiat made a name for himself, literally in 1981, with his street signature, Samo, and a monumental rise in New York's art scene. Basquiat had been exploited, arrested by a hardcore lifestyle, and fell victim to suicide by overdose in 1988. Basquiat's death marked a maturing in not only graffiti, but the streets of Atlanta, New York, and LA. During this time, graffiti was becoming less underground and flooded the mainstream in music videos, fashion, and museums. Meanwhile, the Republican and Democratic administrations fumbled issues like crack cocaine, inequity for minorities, and increased oppression on American citizens, most notably Black Americans who were set years back. 3D style and mystifying wild styles known for their casual drift Graffiti voiced the raw political aesthetics of younger generations. The 80s and 90s saw hip hop go from a fad in what historians call black ghettos to a genre in demand. And Atlanta's own outcast hooked the suburbs with community issues and serious flows. You can look at two very, very prominent artists here, Dr. Dax and Greg Mike, and both of them kind of cut their teeth. I mean, Dax cannot be overstated how important he is for the Southeast graffiti scene. Getting started in Miami and then ended up in Atlanta and has since kind of pivoted towards graffiti influenced art. It's just wild seeing what these guys have done. Chris Beal is another one who's known for his murals, but really knows his way around a spray can. And that's because he used to do more graffiti. And kind of once he had mastered that media and then was able to turn around and do these really, really cool like pop art murals. Basquiat, Shepard Ferry, Keith Haring were cited as the core elite of the movement. But rising stars like Atlanta natives Dr. Dax and David Feuer practiced their passion growing up. The movement also had international power with the colorful Berlin Wall falling at the end of the Cold War. 
Graffiti influenced ads from Sprite, Nike, and other corporations geared towards the 12 to 19 plus demographic. Americans will soon be using cards like this one for everything from hiring a lawyer to closing a mortgage. The internet became more widely accessible for people and writers found a place online. Overseas in a land called the UK, Banksy went viral with unconventional pieces that challenged authority, who worked his way up from tyke status, doing stencil art to freehanding globally recognized rebel works. Girl with the Balloon in 2002. When I moved to LA, lots of graffiti there. It's like Shepard Ferry, I was seeing his Obey stickers everywhere. In America, low income communities all over the country felt decimated by an economic system that wasn't in their favor. This shift could be seen in places like Southwest Atlanta in contrast to the affluent of Atlanta north of Ponce. Graffiti veterans and tykes alike used their voice to inspire hope in the digital age. Credit Hope by Shepard Ferry, as seen on Atlanta's Ponce de Leon and Cabbage Town. The first African-American president would take office in 2009 by the name of Barack Hussein Obama, a massive high point in morale amidst a recession. Criminal charges are filed in the shooting death of Breonna Taylor. After two black men died in police shootings and five officers were killed during a peaceful protest of those shootings. John Lewis, one of the leaders of the civil rights movement and a member of Congress for more than 33 years died yesterday. Into the 2010s and 2020s, the civil rights movement has continued with the Black Lives Matter movement, commonly abbreviated to BLM, a national movement with the callous death of too many African Americans at the hands of bad cops. Today, the spirit of BLM resonates in more communities than ever with commission graffiti and freelance art on social media platforms calling for true equality. It's thanks to these trailblazers that the movement wasn't just a trend. But Atlanta writers today like Orbis and Sockham still have to keep their identities a secret. As a movement, graffiti continues to be stigmatized because of its association with, you guessed it, vandalism. Now, here's a million dollar question. Is graffiti an art form? Yes, but art is subjective. I think it's cool, as long as it looks very artsy and meaningful. If the city, homeowner, or business owner owns properties, and they did not agree or approve it, then that is vandalism. I don't like vandalism. It's a sign of disrespect. Gangs and bombers mark their territory with blunt tags while vandals mark property that's off limits. It's definitely vandalism. <laughs> like, definitely illegal. Like, a massive aspect of it, it's gonna be completely different if you see graffiti on a legal wall. A place designated for art or, like, murals. If you see graffiti on there, you still make the connection to it being vandalism and like criminal. That's what makes it so unique is that you walk around and you're like, yeah, someone like risked, <laughs> they risked something to put their name up there. Or, like, you know, 
And you may think, why? Why do they take the risk? Why do they try to put their name as many places as they can? Like, you can go really deep into the whys and hows of it. And I think that's really interesting. I do believe there's a lot of beauty in street art. I've seen it. But there's also a lot of people who don't utilize street art in that way to where sometimes the messages and the things that you are posting sometimes are hurtful, but are also related to like crime, gang activity and all those things, which could also just be dangerous for the people who you tag their objects or their buildings. For like if you're saying like, hey, this, these people rep here and you're putting that on the side of somebody's building, like that could be hurtful to them. I do think there should be more of a distinction, but I don't think legally there's more of a distinction between the artist and then the people who are just vandalizing. They're all like underneath the same umbrella. And I think that that probably should be changed. A lot of people just interpret it as vandalism. A double-edged sword with graffiti is the fact that it is a platform where you can't spread a message. Sadly, some people use that to spread bad messages. Whether it's going against another gang, maybe police, or maybe like a derogatory thing towards a race, sex, different things like that. But on the flip side to that, there are people who try to spread good messages through that platform. There's a negative connotation to it in the sense that when you see graffiti, your first thing is, oh, maybe it's a gang tag. It shows the negative side to the city when in actuality, that might not be the case, where it's really just somebody wanting to showcase their talent. They don't have another way, another medium to show that. And so I think any art should be appreciated and definitely be looked at a little more. If you're vandalizing a piece of property, I'm not a huge fan of <laughs> vandalism. I just, it's hard for me to get behind that. I also do support people's self-expression. And I think that there are places, thank God nowadays that are dedicated to that. Cabbage Town, the mural walk, entirely devoted to murals and mural artists and graffiti artists. I think there needs to be more of that for people to have a place to go. Vandalism in itself is like just a public display of what's going on in society. Atlanta shutting down the highway because they were trying to cover up the bridge and they shut down an entire highway, backed up traffic just to cover up some tags that the taggers are going to come back within a week and just spray it up again. You can keep it clean, but it's not, it's not even going to be clean for that long. Like I just feel like it's this weird cat and mouse race. Atlanta writers today, like Orbis and Salkum, still have to keep their identities a secret. Graffiti has evolved through each decade with waves of writers, artists that didn't always do things legally, but made a name for themselves. Because of the tykes, the teens, and the trailblazers, you can see what America has been through just by looking at walls or scrolling online. Art graffiti has become more accepted by the general public as a way to engage young and old Americans for education, culture, and direction in this life. My first collection was called ABN, pretty much kind of like an introduction into my world. So it was graphic design and it was based on like a lot of like characters, planetary characters, just being and doing different stuff. Also like wearing like my fashion designs that I'm also like in the works of doing because I really want to start a fashion brand. And it was really just about becoming or like the whole art of becoming the statement, I am a being. That whole sentence in itself, like you could be anything, I am anything. And if you are anything, you are essentially a being. Pieces in Midtown and historical landmarks like Crog Street Tunnel in Atlanta today showcase how far the movement has progressed with controversial writers, activists, and yes, professional graffiti artists sharing the same canvases. Atlanta has like a really cool mix of people who appreciate and understand, but don't necessarily do graffiti. Or if they do, they then kind of pivot and do something like Chris Beale, where he's doing murals all the time, but very little letter work, or at the very least, that's not the central focus. But then you have a bunch of other people who are just out there on the streets. I mean, man, you can just rattle off some names here in Atlanta and it's gone beyond just like, oh, look at me, I wrote my name up here. Like the same way a kid might write on a wall. There's a lot of attention now being paid to like color theory and you see all these like artistic, well, if my light source is here, where would my highlights be? Where's, where am I doing this drop shadow? Should I use contrasting colors or comp? Like, it's wild. Artists turn activists like Fabian Williams and Yulzi Mathurin 
infuse pop culture with social issues in their art, affecting the black community. Yayimi Cabron and Meiti Nazario empower sub-minorities. I could freely put my work up on a wall, leave it, and people can just look at it and admire it. And it's now part of that scene, it's part of the culture. When people come back and look at the vibe of like this area, they're gonna look at that sign and that's a part of me that I left behind in the city. This makes me keep going. Like I wanna be a part of the city, I want my name here. I want people to walk by and see me without even knowing. If you were to take some of these like big pivotal pieces by these writers who people look back and you know, you got dudes like Is The Wiz is like a big one. If you were to take that and drop it anywhere now, people would be like, this is garbage. This sucks, just because it's developed. Commercial street art has expanded to benches, sidewalks, heck, even workplaces, by way of a new generation. The spirit of Basquiat lives on in local innovators, Austin Blue and Alex Brewer, who continue to redefine street art. Lately, I have been seeking it out and trying to see how many of the same writers I can spot. And, oh, is this a new location? And what can I find? Is this a new throw up? I can't imagine driving through a big city and not looking out for graffiti at this point, which is interesting. I do think cities without having graffiti might be kind of bland as well, too. And like I said, because the artists within that city, that community, whatever the culture is, they're expressing that within that city. And I think that's what makes a city unique. It does get a bit boring seeing the same old walls, seeing the same bricks, you know. So to have like graffiti on the walls, you know, see something new, you know, I think that definitely adds a little flavor to the city. If you love it, do it. Because I feel like with a lot of things, if you don't love it, you're not gonna give it hundred percent. So if you love it, do it. But as with everything, there is a right way, a right time to do things. I really think it's kind of just a think before you do, but at the same time, if you love it, practice it, keep up the work, and you know, maybe one day you are like some of these other artists and writers that are recognized. I would say to pick up a little black book and some Sharpies and to practice. Am I encouraging criminal activity and vandalism? For the record, no, but I think for the art part of it, yeah, go get that little book and maybe some spray cans and practice at home. I think it is an art form and there's no harm in practicing art. I think about it like painting your house. Do you leave the walls white or do you put colors on your walls? People like to leave their walls white, but I mean, with graffiti, I kind of feel like that just gives a little bit of culture and it shows that the city is lived in and that there are people here. It shows that you still have a society of free thinkers, of people who are willing to literally color outside the lines, you know? I feel like that's a healthy thing, or just to have a little bit of it is a healthy thing, you know what I'm saying? It's safe to say that graffiti is an art form, whether you like it or not. It's okay if you don't like it, or just some parts of it, but the essence of then and now's graffiti is immortal. Sure, tags can be wiped away, but the spirit never leaves. Being a writer for game design and other things, like in a way it's nice seeing people wanting to spread their message and they put their name to it. At the end of the day, that's what everybody wants to do. They want to create something to be able to say, you know what, I did that. That's my legacy. You can have illegal places and parks where it's encouraged to create freely and publicly. We can make public museums where artists are allowed and encouraged to publicly display whatever they want to in a setting where everyone can go to and just look at it. You know, I think art is a freedom of speech. Well, that's enough preaching for one day. <laughs> I want to thank you for joining me today on this journey and it has been my pleasure serving you. I'll see you later.
Okay, Bradley.